Hello. Today, the four of us will talk about how we've resolved different challenges we've encountered while migrating our legacy pipeline to Airflow. My name is Stas, and I'm a data engineer at Script. First, I'll briefly explain what kind of a migration we were performing. Then, I'll go all in depth and technical about custom trigger rules we've implemented to achieve that migration. Then, QP will describe our migration from Airflow 1 to Airflow 2. Kuntao will share tips on running huge backfills. Dima will describe how we've allowed users to run self service backfills by authoring custom backfill UI plugin. Dima will also share some bugs we've encountered and how we fix them. And he will wrap up by talking about how we're saving money on using custom operators that are aware of spot prices in different AWS availability zones. Let's jump in. To give you a bit of context, I'll say a couple of words about this migration. First of all, we needed to migrate all of our compute and storage from a legacy data warehouse solution to AWS. We choose Databricks on AWS as our compute vendor. We've re-architected the whole data pipeline for improved security and compliance. At the same time, we were switching from our custom job scheduler to Airflow. And another big challenge was that all of our tasks were in the single giant deck of 1400 interrelated tasks. Part of this deck that you can see rendered on a screenshot. Those black lines are bundles of directed dependency edges. That said, let me tell you how we've leveraged the airflow mechanism of task instance dependencies to efficiently migrate our DAG from legacy scheduler to airflow. I'll show some approaches we've tried, problems we've met, and how we've resolved them. Migrating all the tasks at the same time in a DAG of this size while also switching data warehouse architecture was out of the question. So we've decided to migrate this DAG gradually, layer by layer, starting from the tail end. In order to simplify the migration for different teams, we've decided to preserve dependency structure and keep both migration and production tasks in the same DAG. Let's look at the simplified example of our DAG. The three important pieces that you need to know about are first, data sync tool which ran daily before all other tasks in a DAG. It copied all the new data from legacy environment into AWS S3 bucket. Second, production operators that have been successfully validated and migrated. They have been switched off in a legacy environment. And last, migration operators, which were used for validation of output. They run in parallel with tasks in a legacy environment. It's important to mention that migration tasks output was written to a separate database and only used for validation. All operators instead use data synced from the legacy environment as input. That's why these dependencies are marked with dotted arrows. So how can we implement this peculiar dependency structure? Well, first approach, just pretend our migration tasks can behave the same as production tasks and hope for the best. Unfortunately, this approach has a problem. Migration tasks can fail, bringing down downstream production tasks with them. This is a showstopper from a business perspective. In order to solve this problem, we need to hook into the logic scheduler uses to decide whether any task can be scheduled. Airflow defines a bunch of TI DEP classes for this. We need to extend one of them, trigger rule DEP. We will override the depth field in a new custom base operator, which all of our operators extend. How do we change trigger rule depth? Well, we override get states count upstream TI method. It takes a list of finished upstream tasks instances as input and outputs a counter with a number of failed, successful, and total tasks. Then, based on these counts and the trigger rule set for the DAG, Scheduler decides whether this task can be triggered. We need to modify counter logic slightly to always consider upstream migration tasks as success when counting up finished uh, when counting up finished tasks. Here's how situation looks after the fix. Migration tasks are free to fail, and it doesn't impact production tasks downstream from them. Well done, right? Well, not so quick. 
Migration tasks are unreliable. They can fail, but also they can be unoptimized and run for a long time. The situation even worse when you consider retries. All production tasks downstream from long running migration tasks could be held up for many hours, which could impact our SLAs. Ideally, none of the production tasks would have to wait for any of the migration tasks. In order not to wait for a task to finish, modifying the same method get states count upstream TI is not enough, as it only accepts already finished tasks. We need to not only change how we count finished tasks, but we need to change which tasks are considered finished. We will need to inline this method and rewrite the whole section where it's used in get depth statuses as follows. First, we take all immediate upstream task instances by querying database. Then filter out just those that have finished or migration tasks. And finally, count the statuses as before. Always treat migration task state as success. And here are the results. As you can see, migration tasks don't hold up downstream tasks any longer. Unfortunately, there's last problem. This doesn't work if the root data sync task failed. If you remember, this task gets data from the legacy environment on which all the tasks in AWS depend. So if data sync fails, it makes no sense to continue running the DAG. The failure has to be propagated through all the downstream tasks. Airflow already has a mechanism for doing just that, upstream failed status. But our clever code has broken this. And now any status of upstream migration operator is considered a success. We need to give a scheduler a chance to propagate upstream failed status. To see how we can do this, Let's look at a simplified flowchart of the task instance state transitions from the documentation. All the new task instances for DAG run are added as none or no status state. Scheduler periodically checks if all depth requirements are met and transitions tasks into scheduled or upstream failed statuses. Our problem is that we short circuited this process by allowing status none to be considered as success thereby preventing scheduler from properly transitioning a task into upstream failed state. Once we understand how states flow in airflow, the fix is pretty straightforward. First, don't treat upstream migration tasks that are in the non-state as finished. And second, don't consider migration tasks in upstream failed state as success. With this final fix in place, everything is failing as expected after data sync fails. Everything falls like domino. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Das, for the compute migration overview. Hello, everyone. I'm QP. Next, I would like to talk about Airflow 2.0 upgrade and our learnings from the process. First thing I would like to highlight is this is a one way chip. That means once you started with the database upgrade process, there is no way to roll back without losing any data. So it's always a good idea to back up your database before you perform any irreversible production change. The Airflow developer community has prepared a really useful tool called Airflow Upgrade Check. This tool can be installed using pip in your current Airflow environment. What it does is it will check for all the incompatible configs, back files, plugins, and database versions in your current Airflow 1.0 installation. We did spend quite a bit of time going through every single warnings that's outputted from the Airflow upgrade check command and make sure that we fix all of them before we perform the database upgrade. The other thing that we did to help smooth out the process is we make sure that all of our DAG files and custom plugins are compatible with both version one and version two. What this enables us is, as a DAG author, I can promote deployment change to development and staging environments, which were running Apple 2.0, and promote the same change into production environment 
which was running at level 1.0. At the same time, the data engineering team could um, test and iterate on the Airflow 2.0 upgrade process without incurring any interruptions to day-to-day -day data pipeline development and deployment workflow. Now, the first problem we ran into with the Airflow 2.0 upgrade was incompatible MySQL version. Our Airflow installation started with Aurora RDS. At the time we picked the MySQL backend, which only had 5.6 support. But it turns out that Airflow 2.0 requires native JSON column type support in the database, which was which is only available in MySQL 5.7. So there is no easy way for us to perform this upgrade without incurring any downtime. The reason that Airflow 2.0 requires native JSON type support is because the new scheduler, scheduler now requires um, to enable the DAG serialization feature. This feature serializes the DAG into JSON type blob into a database so that the web components of, of Airflow won't have to parse the DAG files anymore. This results in much faster deployment time as well as much less CPU and memory usage. So what we ended up doing was we basically had to shut down all the Airflow components took a snapshot of our 5.6 Aurora RDS cluster. Then we spun up a new Aurora cluster with 5.7 support. And we restored the snapshot into the new cluster and shut down the old one. The other MySQL problem that we ran into was if you want to run multiple Airflow schedulers in 2.0, you won't be able to do it without MySQL 8. This is because the scheduler depends on a row level locking primitive that's only available in MySQL 8. So as a user of Aurora RDS, we are basically stuck with a single scheduler in production at the moment until AWS adds this MySQL 8 support to Aurora RDS. I guess the takeaway for this is if you are starting a new Airflow installation, it's better to choose um, the Postgres database backend instead of MySQL. The other problem that we ran into is DAX serialization with regards to custom trigger rules. As Stas mentioned earlier, we as script heavily leveraged custom trigger rules to help with our compute migration process. What happens with the DAX serialization is in the 2.0 code base, there is a filter that filters out all the custom um, trigger rules from the serialized DAG JSON object. This means if your task depends on any custom trigger rules, those trigger rules will not be applied anymore. So we ended up just patching the core and remove these two filters in the code base so that our custom trigger rules are still being serialized and deserialized through the DAX serialization layer. These two filters were added initially for performance reasons. The good news is we have been running this patch in production for a very long time, and we haven't run into any performance issues so far. Airflow 2.0 came with a lot of performance improvements. The web UI loads a lot faster, renders a lot faster, um, especially for large DAGs. The new DAG view and task view actually will render and load an order of magnitude faster. The new scheduler also runs a lot faster, consumes a lot less memory and CPU usage, which we will show in a second. But most importantly, if you have a lot of DAG files that you have to process, you can now share, um, shard the DAG scheduling uh, workloads into multiple schedulers, assuming you have the correct database version, of course. 
Here is a screenshot of a graph from our Airflow Datadog dashboard. As you can see, um, the blue line is the CPU utilization metric for our Airflow DAC uh, scheduler in production. There is a shop job before and after we perform the Airflow 2.0 upgrade. Before the upgrade, the CPU ut utilization for our scheduler was always hovering all over around um, 90%, which has been causing operational headaches to us. And as you can imagine, with such a low margin, it's hard to set a reasonable alert threshold without causing a lot of noisy alert. Since the upgrade, the CPU utilization has dropped from 90% all the way down to 10%, which had been a great improvement for us. And ever since the upgrade, we haven't received any noise alert from with regards to the uh, Airflow scheduler CPU usage anymore. So, so far we have been really happy with all the new features and performance we got from the Airflow 2.0 upgrade. If you haven't done so, I highly recommend you to schedule, schedule your Airflow 2.0 upgrade, and I hope you will like it as well. Without that, I would like to hand off to Quanto to talk about backfills. Hi, this is Kuntal. I'm a data platform engineer at Script. I'm here to talk about running backfill to Airflow at scale. So when we started uh, this journey, our goal was to backfill data for 14 years, and we tried to run 150 DAGs concurrently. We let us settle to 100. As people say, the sky is the limit, but uh, to reach the sky, there's a small matter of gravitational forces, which is nothing but the limits associated with all the processes. So let us talk about our limits here. The first three limits that you are going to talk about is limit related to Airflow. The three main variables that we actually tuned and play, play with is Airflow core parallelism. Um, the default value is 32. So this is nothing but the amount of parallelism for the executor. Uh, so we overwrite it to 100. Next is the max active runs per tag. It, it is basically the number of DAGs that can run concurrently for the single DAG. We overwrite it to 100. And the last one is the Airflow core DAG concurrency, which is like for a single task belong to a DAG, how many tasks can run concurrently? And we overwrite that to 100 as well. Apart from the data Airflow limits, we got restricted by some Databricks and AWS account limits as well. Our AWS account limit has like 1,000 terabyte of total GP2 EBS volume we increased it to 1500 terabyte. At, at the same time, we also reduced our footprint for EBS almost by 60% by using smaller instances. Then we got hit by 429 too many requests errors from Databricks. Uh, we talk with Databricks and work on, work on that. That next is that we have a limit of Databricks node creation limit, 200 nodes per minute. Again, we talked with the Databricks and then we got those limits lifted. Now, after doing, we do all these tunings, in, we need to know how much actually is too much, uh, how much we can run, how much we should run based on our limits and based on our jobs. This is a graph, this is a screenshot taken in from Airflow UI, I, where it actually says how much time is taken per DAG run and for each day. The X axis is nothing but the dates and the Y axis is the duration. As the graph is showing that when in the number of concurrency was at 31, and it actually got the best performance. When I say best performance, it means the number of hours or number of minutes taken in for the tag was the most less. So we have to be very careful while playing around with those variables that I explained already. And obviously this is not a hard and fast rule there that 31 will work, 45 will not or something like that. It always depends on, on the quality of the job, what kind of system you are using, what are the other peripherals that you have and any kind of other limiting factors. Uh, so, uh, I and pretty much that's it. Uh, happy back feeling that. Hello, my name is Dmitry Suvorov. I'm working in Script as Senior Big Data Engineer, and today I'm going to share with you a few interesting topics. First one is the Airflow Backfill UI plugin. 
As you probably know, Airflow command line interface has a backfill functionality, which helps you to run subsections of a deck for a specified date range. Now let's talk about why do we need this and how we improve this. We had a handwritten framework for scheduling our tasks. With the switch from that framework to Airflow, users lost the direct ability to perform backfills and must now rely on Airflow admins team to execute backfills at agreeable points of time. Need to mention here that our users are unable to use the Airflow backfill CLI because we are running our Airflow inside Fargate containers in AWS Elastic Container Service. And we don't want to give access to the Airflow container because of security reasons. That's why we decided to re return the possibility to run backfills to our users by improving our current solution. Also want to mention that Airflow has an improvement proposal about making backfill functionality accessible from UI, but it's still under discussion. So we decided to implement it by ourselves and maybe contribute it to upstream in the future. At the beginning of implementation, we've considered a few approaches. First one is about all tasks we need to backfill will be processed by the scheduler. So we will implement simple form with only one text area where we will create a JSON with all params we need, then parse it on the backend, create task instances and put them into database so scheduler will handle the processing. Concern is a huge load on the scheduler because our users sometimes want to backfill subsequence of the deck for a long period of time, which is up to five to seven years. In this case, scheduler duck, scheduled duck runs could be affected because the scheduler will be busy for a long time. Second approach was to create our own, our own type of job, which will process backfill tasks right on the web server. Concern is that it will block the UI thread until the backfill is finished and additional load for the uh, web server, which is hard to scale. We've rejected the first two approaches because the, of the huge load either on the scheduler or the web server, which is difficult to balance and scale. So we came up with the third approach, which is scalable and doesn't require any resources from the scheduler or, or the web server. As I said earlier, we are running a few instances of Airflow scheduler and web server in Elastic Container Service. We keep all latest Airflow and plugins caught inside Docker image in Elastic Container Registry. Our backfill UI plugin makes calls from its ACS container back to the ACS to spin one more container where backfill will be performed. As you can see, ACS will spin up new container with exactly the same code taken from ACR for each backfill which keeps us away from managing resources on shared container. So each backfill will have its own container with its own resources. All Airflow instances like web service schedulers and backfills are using the same Aurora DB, which is running on relational database service. This keeps all data in one place and gives us a possibility, for example, to track backfill execution on Airflow UI on the runs page. And this is architecture helps us to perform multiple backfills at the same time without any problems. Here's a few screenshots of how it actually looks like on the UI and in ECS. Here's the new uh, menu button. By pressing this button, user will be redirected, redirected to the main backfill page. Here, user can enter the most common and useful backfill params. Need to say that we haven't implemented all backfill params yet, but we will. After user press start button, he or she will be redirected to the confirmation page with all parameters user entered and all affected task instances that are about to be triggered. And this is what user will see by pressing the OK button. Here is how it looks like on ECS the task created and ECS spinning up a new container for the backfill. And this is the container configuration and specifically a command for execution. Another quick topic I want to cover today is the bug busters. As you may notice, we are big fans of Airflow backfill functionality. And that's why we have faced these interesting bugs. 
first one is backfill versus scheduler interference. Airflow has three types of jobs which actually process DEX and tasks, scheduler, backfill, and local task jobs. We will not speak about the third one. It's here just for the full picture. So let's take a look at the next example. Let's say we have a DAG with two tasks in it, and task two depends on task one. So scheduler creates a DAG run and starts task one task instance processing. Then the backfill job overrides scheduler's DAG run. Scheduler forgets about task two, and it will never be triggered because backfill doesn't know uh, that it should trigger task two, and scheduler doesn't know about this DAG run anymore. So task two will never be triggered and backfill will never finish the dog run and will be just stuck in the running state. Currently upstream fix is under the review. The second interesting bug we found in the backfill functionality is typos in task regex. Backfill CLI command has this parameter task regex. It's optional, but it's really helpful in case you need to run subsequence of the DEX tasks. Let's say you've missed the button and type task three in task regex param. <coughs> when the backfill starts, firstly, it will create a new empty DAG run and puts it into the database. Then the backfill job will go and try to find tasks that match the regex you've entered. Will not find any and will be stuck in running state together with newly created DAG run forever. This bug was fixed by me in the upstream airflow and included in the airflow 211 release. So you will not encounter this bug anymore in case you're using the latest airflow version, of course. And the last topic I want to cover is Databricks cluster cost optimization. In script, we have over 1,000 of tasks running each night, which require different numbers and types of instances for computation. For computations, we are using Databricks, which uses AWS instances under the hood. The main reason why we decided to look at different availability zones is that we are faced with the, we currently don't have sufficient capacity in the availability zone, you requested exception. So our tasks just get failed from time to time with this exception. Also want to mention that AWS regions may be smaller or bigger. It means that the overall number of instances reserved for the particular region may vary. So this problem becomes even worse and you will encounter this exception increasingly when you are working in the smaller region. Unfortunately, Databricks doesn't uh, handle this situation yet, so we decided to fix it on our side. The second reason is that EC2 spot prices are not static across availability zones, which gives us an opportunity to switch over availability zones and find the cheapest one, which could significantly reduce the costs. All our DAGs are built on our custom airflow operators, which work with Databricks. Users, users can even set only the numbers, number of instances needed for the task. Operator will then decide which instance type will be the best choice. Custom operators gives us a possibility to use hooks and APIs like described spot price history AWS API, where we can get all the availability zone prices across AWS region, which helps us to take the cheapest availability zone or fall back to the second cheapest in case AWS doesn't have the number of instances we need. So what we are getting after these changes, it's 10 to 20% of cost savings and obviously more robust solution, which is resistant to lack of instances situation. You can read about this in detail in our script blog post. Thank you. And also we are hiring. Now, questions. <laughs>